Hello, this is Sam Reynolds. I know you haven't seen me in a while. I have not died. I have just moved to New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Some say entrapment. So I've just been enjoying myself here. I just wanted to kind of drop in to talk about this coming eclipse. It is a lunar eclipse that takes place if you're in the continental United States. It takes place early morning of the 19th of November, so that's Friday. But if you're farther out, say like Hawaii, it's going to take place very late on Thursday, the 18th. This lunar eclipse is a partial lunar eclipse that will be mainly visible in the Americas and parts of the Atlantic, maybe the outer rims of Europe. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, but what's most significant about this particular eclipse is that depending on who you ask, depending on how they look at things, it's either a north node eclipse because the moon will be conjoined or close to the north node. Um, some, like Judith Hill, rate eclipses by the sun. So it'll be the sun um, at the south node. And that kind of comes in the formula, which I'll talk about very quickly in a, in a little bit. But the big news is that it's conjoined to a fixed star called Ras Al Ghul or Al Ghul, and the moon will be within one degree of this particular fixed star, Al Ghul. This fixed star um, is described by many uh, descriptions, and just to be clear on the math, the astrology, the actual lunar eclipse takes place, I believe, at 27 degrees and 14 minutes of Taurus, where the sun will also be at the opposite sign in Scorpio. And then uh, Ras Al Ghul is roughly around 26 degrees and 20 odd minutes into Taurus. I'm going to read from you, or read to you, from this great book. Uh, it's actually two volumes, Diana K. Rosenberg's uh, Secrets of the Ancient Skies, Volume 1. And she quotes Manly Hall as saying, Al Ghul is the most evil, violent, and dangerous star in the heavens. Um, and it is associated with some of the most horrible events in human history. That's what she elaborates on. But she actually has some better ways by which we can see this particular fixed star and my understanding of it. You know, it can relate to uh, pain, trauma. And essentially, she says, this is where one is uh, compelled by looking at, when, you, when you're talking about algo, the confrontation and assimilation of the harsh aspects of human experience, where one is dealing with now the idea of violence and sometimes as a witness, it's commonly associated with losing one's head. So let's talk about that because the association of losing one's head is almost in direct reference to one particular character, Medusa. The Gorgon. And what I want to say about Medusa may be different than what you've heard, and so I'm going to take a slightly different take on her. So Medusa was one of three sisters of the Gorgon, who was actually the, the human and most beautiful of the three. The other ones were described, as we classically know Medusa, as having snakes for hair and looking fierce and being able to turn men into stone. Uh, but one thing that's often not talked about is that Medusa, as a beautiful maiden, was actually a votary, a priestess of Athena. And she tended to her temple. And uh, Neptune, who found her, or also known as Poseidon in terms of the Greek idea, found her rapturously beautiful. And one description, if you look at multiple books, like if you look at this book, Classical Mythology, written by Mark P.L. Morford and Robert J. Leonardon, here. Um, one, many books, and if you even look it up online, will describe as Neptune Poseidon had sex with her. Whereas I think what we might decide in terms of 21st century views, he raped her. And why this becomes salient is that in her supplication, meaning Athena, um, I'm not sorry, Medusa, in her supplication for justice, 
because she had been violated as a priestess and a votary and a devotee of Athena, she expected her God to answer her. And her God would not answer her. And instead, in giving her a quote unquote different answer, punished her and gave her the same fate as her sisters and made her into the horrible monster that we know of, know of her, and especially with the tales of Perseus. Why is this important? It's important because one, we emphasize Perseus as kind of the, the hero in the myth of how he cut off her head, she lost her head, and used it to defeat, if you, you know, looking at different myths and stories, um, either he turned Atlas into stone as he was kind of going back toward the Greek Isles. Um, after, and by the way, um, the Gorgons were African, right? They're supposed to be, they would be situated, some would say, around Libya, which is, just to be clear, in Africa. So we could also say Medusa was an African. So he took her head, and then if you watch, you know, movies like Clash of the Titans, which kind of recounts some aspects of the myth, whether you're looking at the Mark Hamill one or the one with the other guy that's from the 21st century, I really have forgotten his name. That's how memorable part of that film was. Um, he um, turned the Kraken into stone using Medusa's head. Well, anyway, one key part of the story that we could look at is her loss of faith, you know, or how she was punished and not given some measure of supplication or support from her goddess. There's another way we can look at this, though, and I think this becomes more important as we're now getting talking to talking about what's going to happen with Algo or this lunar eclipse on Algo. We could say, despite the trauma, the pain that Medusa must have suffered in being abandoned, being raped by a god, no less, I think one thing we could talk about in terms of losing one's head, even before she actually lost her head, was then not recognizing, you know, maybe she got very caught up in sh the shame in some way of losing her sense of self in this particular moment where she was uh, just violated, you know, just in terms of the level of violation she must have felt or experienced. And again, we're talking about this in the level of myth, I am speaking about her as if she were a person, but I am going to go with that particular idea. And because, you know, rape happens to many women around the world in, in terms of minutes. And one thing to contemplate as we're thinking about this eclipse coming is that idea of losing one's head. And what does that mean? Losing one's head is kind of then kind of being so caught up in one's passions and the horror of things that one can't step back and one, rediscover yourself, rediscover the grace that could be also in that moment, rediscover and or even discover the, the greater sense of where you can experience some aspect of the divine even within yourself. And that means, you know, as, you know, Diana K. Rosenberg talked about, where we bear witness to some horrors without becoming the horror, without becoming so caught up in the violence. And this reminds me of some lessons from the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna advises Arjuna to kind of be caught up in what would be a violence and what will be a violence against his, his kinsmen in a war. Um, but not to be caught up in it by, you know, the emotion and the passion of it but more so to be caught up in this is his action that he must perform with some aspect of, you know, aplomb and, you know, as almost like a sacrifice, as a way of dealing with one's divinity, whether you're talking about a divinity that supposedly that's outside of you or within you, whether you're an atheist or whether you are someone who does ascribe to the principles and ideas of theism. So I think one thing to think about in more concrete terms as we're coming toward this eclipse, where are you losing your head? Where are you so caught up in your passions that you're blinded to what really may be happening? 
where you can see a different story, where you can tell yourself a different story, where you can behold a different way in which you understand what you think is fundamentally reality, what has to be. Because what this particular star can testify to Al Gol is where we can be so caught up in our passions because it can actually signify where one experiences violence. But that violence isn't just about what happens to us, but also what we can actually put out. And that can come from roiling passions. Remember, depending on who you talk to, we could be talking about this as a south node eclipse or a north node eclipse. And just take for the sake of argument, the north node is kind of the influx of energy, just like you see this little, or this, this big um, uh, air conditioning unit that during the, the warmer months uh, puts in air into this particular apartment, to this particular house. And the north node is an influx of energy. And that may sound good, but it depends on what kind of influx we're receiving. If it's kind of more toward acquisition of things and kind of being caught up in the treadmill of reality or what we think is reality and pushing forward, then this is where we can become entrapped ourselves in too much. Then if we think about this as a south node in terms of the position of the sun, this is where we have to remember what we can consciously sacrifice be willing to give over into the spirit world, into the world we don't see. It's kind of like the filter. Um, I don't think this particular apartment has, I think it's in that unit itself, where you also filter the pathogens and different things in the air that kind of go outside of the apartment, like having a flu in my, my fireplace. It kind of takes the smoke out. So the south node is more like it takes the energy out and into the other realm. Now, either you can decide to sacrifice and give that over and sacrifice particular modes of thinking or how you're embracing things, or it can be snatched for you or from you. So I would think it's better to sacrifice willingly to think about what are some ways in which I or you, um, any particular person, is kind of yielding too much to the acquisition of things or being caught up in one's emotions that you are willing to part with. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to kind of contemplate these things rather than, especially when you hear, Al Gol, Ras Al Gol, is that like Batman Begins? Um, rather than to think the worst case scenario, start creating the better case scenario for yourself. Because that's what these eclipses also can be. They can be chances and opportunities by which to embrace these energies and grow, especially when they're within orb of planets in your chart. And let me be specific, this eclipse happens at, as I said, I believe 27 degrees and 14 minutes of Taurus. And so you can look at it, I give it eight degree orb, and I don't cross over into other signs, although one could do that. Um, meaning if you have something roughly between 21 degrees of Taurus or Scorpio, to roughly, we could say the 29th degree of Scorpio or the 30th degree of Scorpio or Taurus, I think it's highlighted. I look mainly in terms of that, that um, those placements, you know, that axis between Scorpio and Taurus. That doesn't mean one can completely rule out in terms of squares. The other axis would be Leo and Aquarius. I do focus more on planets some people are like, well, it's going through my fifth house. It's going through my sixth house. It's going through the tenth house. It's going through my eighth house. Am I going to die? I'm not as big on houses unless specifically, when I say big on houses, unless it's specifically hitting a particular point or planet in your chart. Then that's where you might have some points of contemplation. Um, I don't know if the eclipses always kind of register as complete manifestation as it's going through a quote unquote empty house. So this is about almost 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes longer than I had planned, but I wanted to be thorough, especially since I haven't talked to you in a while. And it won't be the last time. It's just that when I can kind of emerge out of this Neptunian realm that we call New Mexico, I will come forth. Until then, have a wonderful week, a wonderful time going into, as we're about to approach Sagittarius season, Inshallah, we'll talk to you yet another time.